What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Random Car Guys. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Um, if you're not watching this, I'm shaking so much. I mean, a hero, I guess, of a lot of photographers and a hero of mine recently on the podcast today from all the way from, uh, from California, Mr. Larry Chen. Hey, how are you? Doing well. Thanks for coming on. Uh, so this whole thing, Random Car Guy, started basically because, you know, when you go to a car show, there's everybody from the little kid who's come with their dad to the old man, you know, in his Corvette with his, with his you know, his, his New Balance is on and his Chrome, right? Like we're all random people, but it yeah. cars brings us together. Um, so, you know, this is why it all started and just give you a little bit of background. Um, a friend of mine, Lou Renova, I interviewed him recently and he's a photographer like yourself. You're a huge inspiration to him. And he's the one that told me about Hooting, Hooting and Autofocus. And so we've recently started doing more episodes like that around Oklahoma and going to see people, you know, and just videoing their passion and, and finding some, some crazy places and some crazy people that most people don't know. But for people who don't know who Larry Chen is, explain to people what you do. Hmm. Well, um, I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners know what Hoonigan is. And probably they, they probably know the kind of content that Hoonigan comes out with. We are lucky in that we are not tied down to a certain location. And naturally, because of my work, as an automotive photographer, it pretty much just allows me to travel the world on someone else's dime. Mm -hmm. With that, we are allowed to have something like Hoonigan Autofocus. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like funded by everybody. Everybody who hires me, in a way, has a part of Hoonigan Autofocus because mm -hmm. Otherwise, how would we ever be able to travel and get all this cool stuff, you know, meeting new people, meeting friends, uh, getting exclusive access to all these collections. It's just really is a group effort to kind of have something like this work because if anybody has anything to do with the YouTube scape or if, if, if you know media at all, you know, it's basically impossible. The, the money just doesn't add up to create something like Hoonigan Autofocus. Everything is so expensive in terms of traveling, in terms of camera equipment, in terms of just everything. So for us to do it, it's, it's definitely a passion project and we absolutely love it. And it definitely you know, keeps us relevant in the car community. Mm -hmm. Part of it is also, it's pretty much continues on what I've been doing for work for over 10 years, maybe even longer than that, in terms of being an automotive journalist. I'm just telling the story of these cars and these shops, these hole in the wall sh uh, shops, and maybe these first time car builders, they've never built anything before. But even if they didn't even have a big budget, they're building something so interesting and they're kind of putting their own take on it. it it's worth a second look and it's worth me actually putting the effort to kind of show the world what this particular builder did. Mm. Yeah, I think the recent videos, uh, the ones that stand out when you mention that, is like the three five six video, the, the that's recent. I think with the like the livery on it, that's so loud. Um, mm -hmm. And then you know, there's the stuff like um, I think it's the MK, the one down in Miami you did with uh, I can't remember his name, but like the the S two thousand swap with the old. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, that thing, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about, right? Uh, realistically, if you see something like that, and if it's not shot in a particular way, it could look like something that's just kind of hobbled together and it's just barely running and it's kind of falling apart. But there is a beauty in that, and there's something so special about that. It, it's just so unique. Right. And, and the story about it and just the looks, it's, it's so crazy. I mean, of course, Florida, right? You, yeah. Only in Florida, you can have something like that and you can drive it on the street and, the, and then the cops don't bat an eye. They just see basically like this open wheel um, race car on the street making all the crazy noises. It, it's uh, really 
cool to tell that story. And the thing is, like, a lot of times when I am doing these videos or when I'm doing these uh, still photograph journeys, especially in Japan, I'll meet with these people, these owners and these shops, and they ask me, why, are, why am I even there? Why do I want to even tell their story? Because in their eyes, they're just this regular car guy. You know, they're just like me and you. They just like building cars. They like working on cars. And what they're doing, they don't think it's anything unique at all. But I just, I have to tell them, like, look, you guys don't realize it, but you're the trendsetters. Like, everyone is looking at what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just doing the smallest part. I'm actually doing the easiest part. I'm just telling the story. This guy probably spent whatever years. Uh, of his life and countless however many dollars or or yen to to build this thing and i just come within three hours i basically capture the story yeah and you, you know you mentioned japan you you were over there was it last year or the end the start of this year end of last year for the for start of this year we really 2020 has been tough for everyone um but lucky for us we pushed so hard in the beginning normally in the winter time it's pretty relaxed for us we try to take some time off and you know when the when it gets warm again in the northern hemisphere racing ramps up and we're pretty much busy throughout the whole year until it gets cool again this year we decided to do something different we decided to push as hard as possible right after the holidays uh tokyo auto salon is pretty much the first uh, worldwide event after that car, I think. But anyways, we, we really put in a lot of effort and you know, we spent a good amount of time there. We shot 15 episodes of Winning an Autofocus. And it, that just kind of started our year right. And then since then, we've been pushing up until the lockdown. Yeah, that mirror in, that, in one of those episodes was, was nuts, right? Was it the mirror that was slammed? <laughs> I think it's probably one of the lowest cars I've ever shot static. It looks so good. Believe it or not. It's, it's crazy that they have that. And part of it is the streets in Japan are so good. It, it's it's kind of like Japan and Germany. It's the thing, you know, they, their streets are so clean. Part of it is because ev almost every street is under construction all the time because they're constantly keeping uh, just paving it, keeping it up to date. And you can actually drive something like that on the streets and not have to worry about it bottoming out. It's the craziest thing. Yeah. Yeah. You do that here and you're just destroying splitters and you, you're not driving 10 feet. It's just a giant. Yeah. And, and realistically, every city, everyone says, oh, this place has the worst streets. Yeah. There are places that have worse streets, but realistically, in LA, it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think the thing that stood out for me on that trip and, and I think watching Lewis light up when you guys go to the Subaru fact, you know, the Subaru museum, like, yeah. I'm a huge Subaru fan. Like I, I'm from Wales, like rallying is big and Colin McRae is huge and Nikki Grist to be in Welsh was a huge thing for me too. And just yeah. seeing like the, you know, the, the classic cars there and watching his face light up. Oh, I, if you have a chance to go to Japan when all this is over, please go there. It's open to the public. If you could believe it or not, it's just one of those things where, you go there and they let you sit in Colin McRae's WRC car and it still has fuel in it. Everything still works. All the buttons and switches, everything it's, it's in like, it's not in museum condition. It's like race condition and it, they just parked it there. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, they probably have to keep it up. Um, I'm sure they drive it too, right? They probably take it to yeah, the stock events. Yeah. Because yeah. everything is in there. You could still smell the fuel. As soon as you pop the trunk um, or the boot, it, you could see the fuel cells intact. All of that, everything is intact. Batteries charged. All of that, it's ready to go. We could have probably started it if we asked, but I was already amazed that we could sit in it and play with all the switches and stuff. Like The thing that really amazed me a lot was the crank, the window crank. Did you see that? Uh -uh. I'll have to go back and watch it. The window crank is carbon fiber, and it's a disc. And the reason why you can't have a normal crank is because the roll cage is there. Okay. More bars. So just stuff like that. And the fact that you can hold any one of their trophies, 
you press this button and then uh, one of the, the curators comes out and they're like, which trophy would you like to hold and take a picture with? Uh, Lewis took a picture with Subaru's first ever rally trophy. And uh, you could pick up any of the WRC trophies. Or it, it's just the craziest thing. And they have that wall where you sign it. But so many historic people, Peto Soberg, um, Aki, Toyota, you know, Toyota, because, you know, they do so much work with Subaru, you know, and they have that partnership with the GT86 and a bunch of other different cars. Um, Mr. Toyota just was in the same place, you know, Mr. Toyota in the building. It's the craziest. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing, like, just like you were saying, you know, because of just the culture and you get to do these awesome things and, and Hoonigan Auto Focus is, it's right at a year, right? It's been going a year. I think I uh, we're coming on one year. Coming on yeah. one year. We're coming on one year, and we're, we're definitely really proud of that. And I, we we try our best not to be clickbaity, and we try our best to. We don't beg for subscribers. Yeah. You know, we don't like subscribe, comment. You know, I try not to do any of that. I try to make it as easy to watch as possible. And a lot of people tell me that it's pretty much the last thing that they watch before they go to sleep because it's a little more tame. It's not so much like burnouts, drifting. It's a, it's a little more tame and it's more car focused than the regular uh, Hoonigan content. The regular Hoonigan content, I feel like, is the thing that you watch when you wake up because it's like loud and burnouts and jumping and like, eh, yeah. you know, crashing. So it's a little different, and we're definitely really proud of that. Yeah. So go, going back a little bit, like, and from doing some research, you know, you, you, you got into cars, you got into photography because you loved cars, right? So yeah. Huge love of cars and, and autocross and all this stuff, and then realized that I'm better at taking photos than I am at racing and got into car photography. Yeah. And I love the way that, like, you document the fact and you're not shy about saying, you know, like, I slept on floors at SEMA. Like I, I, I bummed my way to be at events and I sacrificed all this time away from my family and like missed my yeah. first baby steps. I'm like, that's one thing that I think needs to be shared more and more because people, especially in today's society, are like, oh, I want to be there overnight. I mean, you've been doing this for over 10 years and that's why you are. Yeah. You are. Well, as a journalist, I've, I've been doing it for over 10 years, but as a photographer, automotive photographer, it's coming on 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I... <laughs> Just the other day, or even yesterday, I was shooting with Steph Papadakis, and I was at Irwindale Speedway, and I told him, look, all those years ago, 5,400 days ago, or whatever, I was here, and I was photographing you driving the banks, you know, in your S2000. And he's like, that's so crazy. And, I, and then I quickly said, we didn't make it very far. We're still here at Irwindale, but um, obviously, you He's at a different level now, you know, a huge race team with Toyota, three car team and stacker trailer, all that good stuff, huge shop, a dream shop with AC and everything. And, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm still taking pictures, but of course on a different level. And yeah, and that's kind of the cool story that I can tell with autofocus a lot. We use so much historical footage, so much historical photos that I actually shot. Mm -hmm. So, cause uh, with the, this modern car culture with drifting, we kind of all started around the same time and it all kind of ramped up around the same time as social media. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, you're, you're loyal to drifting. That's where you're at. That's where you started. And, and I, you know, recently watching videos this morning, just preparing, like, you know, you missed maybe one or two events since like 2010 and one of them was for like the birth of your child. So you can give you yeah. that now. <laughs> yeah. I've missed one event. Yeah. Actually, well, one, one formal drift event. And it was for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no other reason for, I would miss an event. Uh, it's the same thing with the drivers, you know, yeah. if they're sick, if they have a broken leg, broken arm, anything, death in the family, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They're there. You know, it's the craziest thing. Form. Such a raw form it, of driving and that with the just have to do it. And I, I, um, one of the craziest stories, my really good friend, Von Gidden Jr. You know, I started shooting him pretty much since the beginning. And I, I kind of feel like our careers, it's like pretty parallel. He 
was an IT guy. You know, he fixed, he, he did like big networks for, or, or whatever, like big IT firms. And that was his day job, but his night job or his weekend job was being a Formula Drift driver. And he would compete at events and then he would do a red eye back home. He's made so many sacrifices throughout his entire life or his career and on the same way. But the craziest story, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, he was at the SEMA show and his father helps out with his program quite a bit. His father passed away at the SEMA show in his hotel room. Um, God bless his soul. You know, I have many pictures of him uh, too, you know, his father, because he was a part of the community and he was part of his program. But Vaughn didn't, he didn't bat an eye because he's not allowed to, you know, like he, he, he's so, he could just, con, he, he could just, uh, uh, just get through it. You know, I know it was tough for him for sure. Yeah. But, but th there's so many stories like that throughout the whole paddock, throughout the our, our whole industry. We ju you just can't bat an eye. You know, I, I can't tell you how deathly sick I've been at events. Now, of course, that's, uh, impossible i mean that's frowned upon you can't do that now of course uh, and um i won't do that anymore you know because of what happened but there there have been times before where i literally thought i was going to pass out because of how sick i was or how high my fever was and i'm still shooting because there's no choice you know if you don't show up don't bother ever showing up ever again yeah I love, I love the Le Mans video that you did and, you know, you're showing like where you're sleeping that night and people are asking, I think you do the video and it's kind of like a Q and A and yeah. it's like, you know, if you stay in a hotel, you never get into the track on time. So we're staying in these containers, which is actually luxury containers. Oh, it <laughs> is. Yeah. It's, yeah. Because, um, the, you know, a couple of steps below that is, you know, below that is sleeping in your car. That's luxury. Even more below that is sleeping in a tent right next to the track. If you can imagine how loud these cars are oh, yeah. and it rains a lot there. Uh, it's just like a mud pit. And could you imagine like the facilities, the restrooms? It's just a nightmare for us. It was already crazy that it was, we had to, it's like these containers, three of us per container and we had these co-ed showers and bathrooms. And I'm like, this is so weird and scary. You know, like I have to put a towel out to, to let people know that I'm using the shower. Yeah. But you know what? That's luxury compared to having to sleep on the floor or in the mud. Yeah, you actually had a shower, right? Yeah, I had a shower, yeah. yeah. How was that, like shooting that, you know, Le Mans for the first time and going through the whole parade and stuff? Like, what was that experience like? Le Mans... It's a bucket list event, and I'm actually really glad that I shot it when I did, when they still had LMP1 cars, mm -hmm. because, of course, you know, going forward, potentially there won't be those crazy prototype cars anymore. It's, uh, it was definitely a bucket list item, and I just can't believe that it happened still. Like it, the whole time, it felt like a dream because of how exhausted I was, but also... Uh, now looking back on it, I look at the pictures and I think to myself, like, it's crazy that they exist at all. Yeah. The pit lane shot of the Porsche in the rain comes to mind. Yeah. So I, that actually was shot, um, was at the 1000 kilometers of Sebring. Okay. I remember, but, yeah. but I have so many similar shots. Uh, one of my favorites actually was of a, of a Ferrari, which what's funny is, um, I've been selling those prints to kind of keep busy and it's been really helping us a lot uh, during these times. And the, the fans, these fans are crazy. Like this guy in Israel bought a print of that Ferrari and he's like, what number it, was it? What place was it at the time? What, all of that, what place did it finish? All that. And I'm like, well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just going to do the homework for this guy because he seems like such a big fan. You know, I looked it up. He finished 28th overall or whatever. He's number this. And my guesstimate at the time, he was this place yeah. in the race. It's so crazy. It's cool that they're getting into that kind of detail. Yeah. Is, uh, is Dave Lister from the UK? 
Yes. Okay. Yeah, Dave is a good buddy of mine, and he's uh, a pretty much legendary status in terms of being an automotive photographer. And I, he's inspired me so much. And a lot of people, one of the questions that I pretty much have to answer every interview is, who inspires you? Uh, he's someone who definitely inspires me. Sure. Just my peer, but also he's been around. He's been shooting racing longer than I've been alive. And you can tell, you know, he's one of the few old timers. He's going to hate me for calling him an old timer. He's, he's one of the few legends that transcended, you know, from film photography to digital and he used it to his advantage. Mm -hmm. So he's always pretty much shot, I think the same way, but once we got to digital, I think it, it, it transformed the way he shoots even more because he could be riskier and riskier and riskier. This guy, he, he really taught me shooting how to shoot at like a, a quarter of a second, even half a second pans. This guy does. It's, it's insane how steady his hands are. My hands aren't that steady. And people always wonder why am I machine gunning all the time? Why am I laying on the shutter? It's because I'm not that steady and I have to, use the technology to my advantage to overcome that. And, yeah. but, but when I see him shoot, he's shooting fifth of a second, fourth of a second hands, and he's getting actual sharp, usable shots all day, every day. I can't do that. I just have to use technology to overcome that. Yeah. That's, that's one of the good things as well that I, that I like though, is the fact that like, you know, you through just pure repetition, of, you know get the shots and i think it, you know one of the mm -hmm. comments you made in a, in a video is if i get one of 10 i'm lucky you know and like oh, one. One of, and like that's why you take average of 750 photos yeah a day yeah, yeah. You know, one of it. 10 is a really really good hit rate yeah. one of 100 is typically what it's what it's like for me you know if i'm going for that one like the one for example um one of my favorite shots from last year was at Daytona 24 hours. It's like that shot that I shot through the Christmas lights. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was probably one out of 250, you know? But guess what? What does it matter if it's 249 outtakes? That one is, I'm very proud of. And, and um, I'm lucky that Canon, you know, one of my partners that I work with, Canon has been so proud of it and they've been printing it out you know, using it at trade shows before this whole pandemic thing. And they've been kind of promoting photography, promoting their cameras using that photo. Um, yeah. that, makes, that makes me happy, you know, because part of it is that it's not so much a car photo anymore. You know, it transcended being a car photo and it's turned into something that uh, normal photographers can actually relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, to to that point, like I think during the video, it's great because you go up and you explain why you're in that spot and why you went up there and you saw these lights and and that's another thing I think that you know anyone has enough money to go out and buy one of these cameras, right? But it's the it's the way you take photos, it's where you are, and that's what makes the shots what they are, right? I mean, anyone can stand in the middle of a street yeah. and take a picture of a car, but you know, are you down on the ground? Are you up in the stands? Like that's that's what makes and that shot exactly is you know shooting through Christmas lights like that's. Awesome. It's, diff it's different. It's definitely putting in the hours. And I can't tell you um, day in and day out. I get so many messages about people saying, hey, I'm starting this car page. Um, what's the quickest way to get likes? Or, hey, I want to do what you're doing. What's basically the overnight way to do it? You know, I, my, my simple answer is to say, I usually just say, hey, shoot what, what, what you love. Because guess what? I love cars. I love racing. That's what I shoot. Yeah. Well, what I don't say is, hey, shoot shoot it for 15 years straight. You know? Yeah. I love uh, I love that, you know, on Instagram, like for your first 100,000 followers, you shot purely off your Samsung phone. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> that was kind of like a stubborn thing to prove a point. But uh, I, I think it was good. It, it kind of taught me a lot about photography and so much about just proving the access part of it. You just 
have to get that access. And at the time, I think it actually helped me because it didn't really, um, I didn't really have to think about shooting something on on uh, my DSLR for social. Uh -huh. I, I just my social stuff was just super quick and dirty, just on my phone. Now it's so crazy because, of course, the amount of followers that I have, and also I need to keep up the quality. At the time, I didn't care. You know, if it was a terrible photo, I'd post it anyways because it's just about the subject matter. You know. Yeah. How many? What? What is the follow account at right now? Like, how much you you obviously invest quite a bit of time in. In, yeah, um, and, and I'm a lot of people, do, you know, wonder who's handling my social account. It's just me. I'm the only one who does it, and I spend quite a bit of time, a couple hours a day on it, just kind of prepping photos for it and prepping videos. And of course, you know, my team helps out a lot on the content side, but uh, in terms of posting and in terms of just moving things around and making sure things are perfect. I just do that. And yeah. uh, I'm at 435, I think. Yeah. So, you know, one day I'll hit a million and then it's like, all right, now we hit a million. Now we just have to continue doing right, the same thing. Next. Get yeah. 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 It's funny that like, you have everyone like say, you know, I got to get to 10,000 because I get the swipe up thing and then they get there and like, oh. But yeah, what's, what's next? <laughs> It's just so many, it's endless. Yeah. I mean, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. Um, what does it matter? You know, if I get to a million, there's plenty of people that have 10 million, 20 million. Um, I guess the thing that really, what matters to me is that, that I have a little bit of a voice in the community, especially also with Hooning and Autofocus. Mm -hmm. And you know, like during these times when we're selling prints to kind of get by to keep the lights on, if I do a shout out on it, people actually support it. And in return, they get something unique and something pretty cool. And well, this is kind of one of the fun things that I do that a lot of people uh, probably don't realize uh, I do. I actually give a very unique one-off photo in every single thing that I sell. Um, and everyone is signed and it's because it's a, it's an instant yeah. shot, you know, so it's hundred percent completely unique. And I try to get really, really some interesting shots with it. So I always try to keep my instant camera with me. Here, let me grab some more. Yeah. Real quick. So these ones that I just shot recently um, are, are really cool, but it's just one of those things where it's um, something that you normally won't see. Let me see if I can find one real quick. Sorry. I know this is a low. No, you're good. So this photo is of Ken Block in the unicorn. And when I see this scene, like I try so hard uh, to get as many different versions of this yeah. with my instant camera, but I, I just feel like this is something special, you know, something that you really can't get as a normal person. Um, you know, unicorns on meth, you know, methanol is, <laughs> is in the air. My eyes are watering. Ken's ready to go, but I'm just there right in his window shooting as many photos as I can of, uh, uh, with my instant camera just yeah. so I can give them out to people who, who support me. That's so awesome. Yeah. But, and, and the thing is, I don't talk about it. You know, it's just, for me, yeah, it's just I cool saw, saw to, to have, have a surprise for, for, for people when they, when they support me. Yeah. I saw that picture you posted. I think it was on your Instagram recently of that super <laughs> picture you just showed. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, All right. I've never seen that. Until you sign it, you know, like, never seen that before that's that's something that's really cool like and, and someone who gets that you know it's super unique and like i said if you don't talk about it much they know it's even even better but exactly uh, exactly yeah i don't want to promote it like oh hey guess what you know <laughs> because then people are gonna be like why didn't i get the ken block one yeah <laughs> talking of ken block that that picture i, I recently rewatched um you know the documentary on 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 tv and mm. like 
the you know the famous evo corner which is no longer the evo corner now it's your corner um you know, uh, you know when you when you run up to him with that, knowing that you got that shot of that, mm. like what is going through your mind? I mean, everyone heard from Ken's point of view what's going through his mind and, and Brian's view and like you know the whole corner. But what is going through your mind when you when you're watching this go down and, and then you get the shot? Everything is just so, um, I guess, mechanical, and it, everything is just so much based on my past experiences. Uh, leading up to that, there's just so much going on. Like, I'm going through my head so many times, over and over and over. Where should I be? What settings should I use? What uh, focal length? You know, it, just everything possible. And I second guess myself constantly up until the moment is coming and there's no more time left. You know, it, it's, it's the craziest thing. Uh, with that one, it was unique in that I kind of pictured in my head. I saw the scene and I pictured in my head of what it should look like. So first of all, I chose that location. There was a couple options in terms of where to be, but I figured that would be the one because uh, typically on, on race days, uh, when we're covering Pikes Peak, we're not allowed to be there because it's just too dangerous. So... I'm like, hey, okay, this is the spot to be. Then I realized that what kind of shot that, that's possible. So I kind of saw, oh, this would be so cool as a pano. But it was a cloudy day and the clouds were coming in and it was sunny and the clouds are coming in. And then it's like, oh, hey, Ken's warming up the tires. And then, oh, wait, we, we can't go yet because of whatever. It, it was just so much time where I'm like, all right, uh, it should be this setting. Oh no, I should, oh, it should be this. Uh, you know, like it, it just, I just changed it so many times. And then I kept doing the pano. Like I kept tiling it over and over and over. I have hundreds of photos with it, you know, in the sun and then it's cloudy and then, oh, it's kind of gloomy. And then it's this and it's that. Um, right up until the point where he actually did it. It, it was just constantly changing. And then after he came through it and did it, it's just the weirdest thing. Like I, I, I remember very vividly what it was like. And actually the thing that I remember the most is of us almost getting hit. Well, I mean, not really getting hit, but like um, he, he, his nose was just right there. Like I could have just reached out and touched his nose. And part of it is, he, of course, he was in full full control, but in, in that instance, you just kind of have to keep your drift. You know, if you straighten out, sometimes you're just kind of understeer and go into the mountain or go off. So he just kind of kept the rhythm going, you know, and we just, all of us, all three of us, me and my buddy, uh, Matt Johnston and Scotto, on that little ledge, we just became like his clipping point. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Those are the days that, that just make you love what you do, right? Like you're on you're on Pikes Peak, Ken's driving the Hunicle, and you're with everyone that you worked with and spent so much time with, and uh, they're all friends, right? And then you get a shot like that, and it's like, you know. Yeah, and I, I definitely regret not um, doing stuff like autofocus earlier because if I shot an autofocus of that event or even that moment, um, it would have been pretty cool. But with that said, uh, Doing autofocus and shooting video while I'm shooting stills definitely takes away from my stills. So I could honestly say at that time, I was 100% focused on my still photography. Mm -hmm. What do you prefer doing? Like with the stills or with like the rollers? Like what is? Mm, I mean, I guess any time I have my camera in my hand, it's not a bad day. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, you know, you, and you mentioned earlier, you've been to a lot of events around the world and you have this relationship with Toyota and, and recently gone to the Mexico rally and, you know, just seeing those, the culture down there for just love of things going fast through the, you know, through whatever it is. Like that's, that's a special environment to be in. And I guess, was that the last event you went to before this lockdown? That was the last worldwide event. And at the time, Mexico, I think only had like four confirmed cases and it was, not even anywhere near uh, Leon. Yeah. But uh, 
they the event went on and they wanted to kind of close it out properly unfortunately it did get short in one day um but it, it it was still pretty much a full rally because i think they have to finish at least half of the rally mm-hmm. to or half the stages for it to count as a as a full yeah um, wrc round but yeah they actually finished it and i was very 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 happy to be able to kind of experience that before um, the last event before things change forever yeah, I think one of my other favorite events that you covered on on Hunigan Autofocus is the Baja, and you're shooting from the helicopter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, it's it's really every time that happens, it's like a pinch me moment. Like I can't believe I'm actually doing this moment, and it, it's it's crazy that something like that exists. Really, it still is insane. And honestly it's just a bunch of rich guys who love racing and i'm cool with that because they could be spending their money on a lot stupider things right you know? uh, i'm very very lucky and very happy to be a part of part of that group yeah they, they love racing so much and it's so good for the economy for mexico um and it's just so good in general it's just like a culture thing yeah, definitely. When you've got, you know, racetrack going by someone's house, I think you landed in somebody's backyard and stayed the night and have real authentic Mexican food and then wake up in the morning and just out the front yard, you're shooting cars going by the driveway. I don't think there's any other country that would allow that. Like, yeah. You're legitimately your driveway, your front, you know, as soon as you pull out of your driveway, as soon as you pull out of your house, um, there's trophy trucks going by at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. I, I don't think that could exist anywhere else besides Mexico. It's the craziest thing. It's so cool. Yeah. It almost it's almost back like going way back to the group B days, right? Where there's like no health and safety and people are getting hit by the cars and it's, them as they go by. It's it's not almost like it's exactly like. It's exactly like it. Yeah. I mean it's just as dangerous too, you know. People unfortunately pass away pretty much almost every year, every race, because you most of the time it's because they're not being very smart about it. Um, I don't know what it is with the locals. They love playing chicken with these things. They, they think that they, they're invincible. And, and it's, you know, in Group B days, it's very common for the cars to cut people's fingers off. If you get hit by one of these trucks, you are pretty much done instantly. These trucks, they, they just have so much metal and they're moving so fast. Uh, I think one of the last races that I covered, um, a bunch of people were moving easy ups and like coolers and stuff, and they were trying to run across this dry lake bed where these trucks are hitting top speed, where they're actually hitting over 150 miles per hour. That's one of the areas where we actually can't keep up with in the helicopter. They're probably going 25, 30 miles per hour faster than we physically can fly. So, um, yeah, I think somebody got hit uh, as they were trying to go across the lake bed. But it's just part of it is just you, you just kind of have to figure out your risk, you know, yeah. how much you want to risk. Yeah, that's it's nuts. I think one of the favorite, one of my favorite photos from that is, is like the guy who's on the motorcycle and it's the you know the sun setting down. I think there may be another another helicopter in the shot or something. Like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Really cool. Yeah, uh, it's just. One of those moments, my buddy Dave, who flies for me, he uh, said on the radio, the first time I, I flew with him in Baja, and we were on the beach, so we were underneath the car, we were uh, flying over the ocean, and I look up almost through the blades, and I see a car on the cliff on, above us. And then I look to my right, I look above me, I look below me, and it's probably like 20 helicopters, all of us following the leader. And then he looks at me, he's like, what, do you think this is a rich sport or what? A rich person sport? And I'm like, oh my God, this is the <laughs> craziest thing. And uh, yeah, since then, that, that's like, that's like the moment. I, I feel like it, it's never going to be beat. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I have a few more. I want to be respectful of your time. Um, obviously, me being from the UK, you know, I, I was lucky enough. I went home. Uh, Christmas time and got to go to caffeine and machine and check that place out. Oh, Bill, 
did an amazing job with that place. So I was actually thinking about that place today. I was thinking, um, I hope they're doing okay, and I hope they can open up soon. Yeah, I know they're on lockdown. I think, um, mm-hmm. but you know, it's it's places like that 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 make it awesome for people that love cars. You know, I think there's a few around the states, but like, it's it's what car culture is, and it's coming together and having car meets and stuff like that. It's it's really cool to see, and I mean, what a location they have. Yeah, I. <laughs> You say that there's locations like that in the States. I've never been to a place like that in the no. States, ever. I think, I was th- yeah. I think Arizona, 4 till 4 is a coffee spot in Arizona. I think it's a good place. Really? Yeah. So it, I, I've never been to that, but I am I guess I'm more just talking about the type of cars that show up. Sure. I don't know what shows up to the Arizona coffee spot. Yeah. But I know the quality of builds that show up to Caffeine and Machine day in, day out, nonstop. Uh, and it's so cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's cool to see supercars and high end, expensive cars. I want to see the modified cars. And there are plenty of really nice modified cars that people, it's just like centrally located, I guess. It's just like in a good area. It's just, it's the best. I love that place so have much. I can't wait to go back. Goodwood? Have you been to Goodwood yet? I have. Okay. Um, yeah. how, how does Goodwood stack up to like the rest of, you know, because it's a little different and it? it's very kind of like. It's, uh, I, I definitely think it's up there. It's probably one of, it's definitely in the top five events for me, for, for people uh, to, to check out on the bucket list. It's definitely something that I just, same thing, I didn't really, I couldn't believe that it existed. It was so cool. Um, it's 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 just cool to be able to see these cars that you've only seen in pictures, and, and to see them run, and you, know, you can smell them and yeah. see all the little details and see that they're not perfect. You know, a lot of the fiberglass is cracked or um, super dirty, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's that that's the best thing in it. It's like seeing that someone's passion in this. It's not it's you know, it's just the whole form and function and just the love of what they've built in their backyard. But yeah. uh, I have a f- question from Elliot at Green Over Tan, a friend of mine who's just done an amazing Instagram page called Green Over Tan, the color mm-hmm. combination. He said if you could own any car you've shot over the years, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Tough question. That's really tough. Mm-hmm. I mean, the easy answer would be to say something like the McLaren F1, but I guess I'm more realistic in that I would rather say something that I can potentially own in the future. Uh, there's too many, really. There, there really is. It's just so many. And yeah. I guess that's the fun part of it, right? I'm not like stuck on one brand or one make or one type of car there's so many off-road vehicles and so many weird things that, that i will eventually hopefully i'll be able to own. yeah speaking of off-road you just supercharged your xj how's that going right now yeah it's uh sounds good yeah it's very whiny it, it's it's crazy because a lot of people are like oh i'm not gonna spend that much money on uh, force induction for my xj or my toyota and uh my response is What's the, is there a, another option to making more power? Because I don't think there is. <laughs> this is it. If you want more power, you either get another kind of truck or you swap the motor. What? How much do you think that's going to cost, or how much effort do you think that's going to take? Yeah. You know. Uh, so, in terms of um, factory fit and finish, there's nothing better than the Magnuson kit because. Magnuson superchargers used to make the kit for Toyota uh, TRD. So if you go and you bought a FJ or a, uh, a Tacoma back then when they were on sale, you, you could get it as a factory option. And uh, it was actually like a TRD Toyota racing development kit, but it was made by Magnuson. So they just kind of continued their line. and You can still buy them, which is really, really cool. Yeah. What what else is on the driveway at the moment? Um, I have that. I have uh, the Corolla hatchback. I have the Toyota Supra, the uh, A90, um, 996 turbo, 240Z, 
um, LC 200 Land Cruiser, and uh, uh, my wife drives a Range Rover Sport. Nice. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, everyone listening can go see the pictures of these cars because I think that the SEMA build Corolla was really cool and then your, your 240, which I'm thankful, glad that you didn't sell. Uh, you oh, know, yeah, I'm so glad I didn't sell it. Yeah. Uh, hey, there was one point where I needed money and I wanted yeah, to sell that yeah. thing, you know? Um, because guess what? I was trying to get, get as much money as I can to uh, pour into photography. Yeah. And selling that would have been good to buy me one camera body and one lens or at the time uh when the around that time when i was trying to sell it the 1ds mark ii was eight thousand dollars right and that was a lot of money and if i sold my z i probably could have just bought that body and then maybe one small lens yeah now you have three canon mark what 1dx mark threes just recently came out yeah, I'm, I'm so I can't tell you how how happy I am, how lucky I am to be able to work with Canon on on um, launching those cameras. Yeah, which uh, yeah, I still can't believe that they asked me to do that. Yeah, but I'm I, like a car photographer, you know. I don't shoot weddings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm not an Olympic photographer like yeah. the normal people that they sponsor and the normal people that they work with. It's just always the level is just something else. Yeah. The uh, the tech and uh, I think the video you posted on your Instagram with with the shooting the drift car and, and just oh, you know shutters open and just the new camera like just focusing everywhere and it, it, oh yeah um, just doing his thing <laughs> so all right last question from Lou because uh, he is you know he's the one to put me on to you and and he shoots for the Street Outlaws uh, Asian and farm truck so he's in the he's works for Discovery and works with them. Uh, he's in town, oh, cool. Oklahoma City. His his Instagram's at four hundred five underscore photo. Has almost done hundred thousand subscribers right now. But he he swears by you. He you know you are his inspiration. So um, and this is me thanking him by asking his question. He said, "Do you want to ever shoot illegal street racing? And if so, he'd love to help you with it." Oh, <laughs> I shoot a real really realistically. I shoot a lot of illegal things. Um, but street racing, right? Not drifting. Yes, yeah, so this so, is great street drag racing, like, you know, I, on TV and stuff. Oh, man. That, that's – my mouth is watering just, just thinking <laughs> about it. Happy listening to this? I can't tell you how much I would love that. Yeah. You know, yeah, a lot of things that we do are illegal. A, a lot of things that I'm capturing. But I have to say, most of the time, uh, we're being safe about it. And when it's not safe, that's when I'm out. I'm like, I'm out. I don't want anything to do with it, you know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, what's to say something is safe? And especially, like, in one country versus the other. Like, I went to I went to Germany. I drove 285 miles an hour on the Autobahn, <laughs> <laughs> you know? But it was completely legal. Right. Uh, and then now, if I go on the freeway here in Los Angeles and I go 66 miles an hour, I'm breaking. Yeah, you're getting arrested. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely shoot um, any yeah. kind of racing, whatever kind of racing it is. Yeah, the the drag car culture in, in Oklahoma City that's that's kind of where we're at. Street racing, we have a lot of mm. we have a couple of these very straight roads, and then they flat. So that's that's kind of the culture here, and he's definitely in the thick of that. And then there's another place just down the street you may have heard of, Classic Recreations. Mm, yeah, like, no, I love their. So they're their just work. down the street from me. Uh, about 10 yeah. minutes ago. Oh, okay. So I, I shot one of the cars really early on in my career, and uh, it was just kind of cool to help them out a little bit. Yeah, awesome. Well, if you're ever down that way and you want to shoot some of this stuff, or, or I'm sure Lou would love to help you shoot some street racing stuff, uh, mm. we'll definitely connect. Ready. Have a coffee and whatever, but, mate, this has been I, amazing. I really yeah. I can't I can't thank you enough for taking the time and, and – Everyone's been saying like, how how have you got to this? I'm like, I just sent you a message. <laughs> like, it's hey, I'm open to it right now. Not much is going on, and and uh, yeah. I've been trying to do as many podcasts and, and interviews as possible, just because um, definitely keeps me busy. Yeah. But also, you know, it's just like one other thing that we can do to kind of spread the love. Sure.
Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, mate. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link everything below for everyone that doesn't follow you. I can't imagine there's many people that listen to this that don't follow you. But um, thanks for everyone listening and we'll catch you next episode. Cheers.